following program is a paid presentation. The views and or opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KWAM. Oh, money, pod me home. Religion, science, myths, and legends all point toward the next evolution in human consciousness. What do the invisible realms hold? Who's telling us and how do they know? We are investigating insights from around the world to answer the question, what does the material world arise out of and where do we go once we've dropped the body? You're about to go interdimension with Robert Wallace and Adam Jeffrey to Undiscovered Spiritual Realities. My own brother, sister. Get ready to ride the esoteric wave of wisdom, because we're going all in this hour. We're touching on Epoch, Depoch, Apoch, Rufa, tips for going interdimension coming up this hour. Also, the universal laws governing road rules. You're not going to want to miss this. And finally, law of attraction for conservative Christians. Yes, it's in the Bible. Coming up. So, today, we are talking about... Uh, let me start off by pointing out, Adam Jeffrey is not here with us here in the studio. So it's a uh, chapped, uh, full of excitement block of Robert Wallace here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Christian Apocrypha, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, uh, the metaphysics of driving, amongst other things. And I think that's actually a good place to start. If you're driving right now behind a car uh, wheel, hopefully you're behind the wheel part of the car, uh, and you're driving around and you're experiencing the normal phases of existence for most of us, which is varying kinds of traffic, varying relations to other kinds of drivers. You're probably uh, at one point or another in the day suffering from somebody's discourteous behavior, from uh, somebody rushing through the road. And uh, I think we all go through uh, the first having the first instinct of kind of resenting that kind of driving. Uh, but at the same time, we don't realize that for other drivers, we're frequently that guy. So what significance does our thought process have to what other people are doing to us? And what does our behavior change as far as what the universe is giving back to us? The road is a really great example because things happen so quickly on the road, whereas in regular life, our karmas or the consequence of our actions can sometimes unfold in uh, unrecognizable ways, but on the road they happen quickly. If I see uh, somebody get in front of me and I honk to let them know they're wrong, even though I was safe from rear-ending them, but just to invalidate them, it's that kind of thing that doesn't come out of love that on my way home will be re-stimulated as soon as somebody's honking at me for driving a safe speed or something like that. So we see that what we're giving people is going to come back to us. And if you've ever been cut off by somebody but were able to restrain your hand from the horn, that means you don't feel a need to be their educator, to invalidate the person, to let them know that something almost happened that isn't going to help them anyway, then you'll also see that you will sometimes make bad choices and there will be forgiveness and compassion coming from those other drivers. On the other hand, if you're in the habit of flipping people off and cussing at people, then yours is a world of rage and there is no shortage of things to enrage you. So I think one point that the whole world needs to hear put out here is what's happening when we're in a parking spot and we back out of that parking spot. What's the spirituality of that? Well, I know when I'm leaving a or trying to get a parking spot somewhere and somebody pulls out, there's almost a tendency to want to invalidate this person driving backward out of their parking spot to let them know that they cannot see you and they are endangering everybody through this action of daring to back out and have you come around the corner. Which is to say... When we get upset because people are backing out of a spot and we have to stop on our way through a parking lot, it's a very irrational sort of feeling. But I know I've backing up out of spots and people have gotten upset. And then I felt the same way. And then I'm asking myself, why would I get upset at this person who's driving backwards who can't see me? They can't see me. And why wouldn't it be a 
incumbent upon me to stop and let them through, seeing how I can see them. I think things like this are important, that we're compassionate and we understand what other drivers are doing and going through and not be so quick to invalidate them and um, make ourselves right by making them wrong. When it comes to driving down the street and wanting to get to your destination, we want to get there quick. And sometimes there's a slow driver in front of us. Sometimes all the traffic is really relaxed, but we're the ones that are really ready to go. So what is it that we can do in this situation to actually expedite our way through, almost psychically move traffic? And I'll tell you what you can do. First and foremost is to remember that you're not racing these people. Tell yourself, I am not racing you. And let them get ahead of you if they look like they're in a stride. Even stall yourself for them. And while you're taking these small, selfless actions, you position yourself for openings in traffic, which you otherwise would not have been set up to take advantage of. If your intention is to get out of people's way in order to expedite your journey instead of get everybody else out of your way, those two different thought processes have two different effects on uh, what happens. Because what we send to another person psychically in terms of what we need actually creates a resistance in the other person. When we're selflessly in the heart or the mind of service to another person, they are inclined toward service toward us, toward compassion toward us, toward letting us through. So your thoughts are so significant to how other people are going to respond to you. I know growing up being soft-spoken and sort of a, you know, a, having sort of a kind nature, at those times when I would speak up and get upset, I find that people would get particularly rough with me and think that I was uh, particularly cruel when I'm not any more uh, upset or enraged than anybody else who has a reputation of, of telling people how it is and, and nobody says anything to them. I think that uh, when we look at how we are approaching people, uh, we're going to get either assistance out of them because of the way that we're approaching the situation or we're going to get pushback. And when we are trying to assist people, when we're trying to get what we want through uh, offering uh, our uh, patience and our service to them in light of what they need and putting even our needs under that or even making them obsolete, we have a better chance of getting what we want. And if you're the kind of person who isn't really allowed to tell people how it is, it's probably because your soul nature already tells people that you're a certain kind of person and people don't want to hear that from you. So you better continue on your journey of softening yourself up and trying to stay in service of other people, not trying to, if you can't beat them, join them and take this route of uh, commanding things out of people. But develop your loving side. If somebody's trying to pass you, slow down, let them pass you. If uh, somebody's trying to get over, you know, pull back, let them in. You know, people are trying to get an exit. People are trying to uh, uh, resolve their, uh, their driving issues, getting to where they're going. And we shouldn't be taking offense because somebody comes through us like that. Make room for them, and you'll find that people will start making room for you. It's, it's a synergistic, symbiotic relationship that we have psychically with other drivers. And the law of attraction, which you put out, karma, you get back. Whatever a man sows, that too shall he reap. Uh, I want to go interdimension today. I want to tell you about my interdimensional experiences. I want to help you get into an interdimensional state of conscious awareness where this physical world falls away and a spiritual plane comes into view. There is a, a pretty simple uh, meditation I can advise one toward, but it does require uh, patient practice because uh, 
that tips, there's a lot of things that have to be implemented at the same time while not thinking of any of it at all. So my major breakthrough came uh, about four years ago, and I started talking about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, I was listening to Rudolf Steiner, an audiobook of his, called How to Know Higher Worlds, and he said if you are not having these interdimensional experiences, it's because you're not doing the meditations. And I realized he was correct, because I wasn't doing the meditations. I was intellectualizing everything. I was collecting a bunch of information, but I wasn't doing the deed that was going to, you know, get me this phenomena. And the meditation uh, I ended up doing that day as I went back to work for my lunch break, sitting at my desk looking at this plant, uh, committed to not leaving my place of work, which I could have because of my role there. And I was going to stay all night if I had to, meditating on this plant until I had this end phenomena. This meditation has a few parts to it. It suggests, A, that you use a plant uh, as your meditation object, and there's spiritual reasons for that. The plant is a living organism, and its petals ha are of the most ethereal nature, ephemeral nature, I should say, and there's something uh, very etheric about it that makes it the thinnest sort of bridge between this dimension and the next. The spiritual, tender, delicate energies of the petals are uh, your bridge into the spiritual dimensions. Holding a plant in front of you, not literally holding it, setting it before you, be holding it in front of you, in a quiet state of objective observation with as stilled and silent thought as possible, uh, with a couple other uh, provisions, causes something to change in your observation. When it comes to stopping all thought, which is the challenge that uh, pretty much every spiritually minded person is trying to achieve in their life, there is actually a little bit of a trick to not having perfect silent thought and still being able to attain these spiritual dimensions in spite of that. And the key to that is that whatever thought is funk that can't be uh, uh, that isn't about the plant from the plant's perspective and this will later carry on to any object you're observing uh, that's going to bridge you over into an interdimensional state the thought needs to be from in this example the plant's perspective so I need to think what is it like to be this plant to have these petals unfolded to sit in this room to stare at this wall or the ceiling all thoughts are about the plant from the plant's perspective. This can replace, in a sense, the silent uh, stillness of thought. Because if you can't stop it, that will still actually allow you to go deeper into the soul of the plant, and it'll carry you over into another world. Another component of this sort of meditation is imagining or having a sense for the light of the moon while you're gazing into this uh, plant. The light spectrum of moonlight actually veils, according to legends and, and myths, the spiritual beings who live in that sphere, in that spectrum. So yeah, we have poltergeists, we have spiritual form, disembodied form, thought forms, you know, angels and demons are all walking around us right now. They're walking through you, they're, they're flying around, but you can't perceive them. Uh, so... We, we need to be able to see into that dimension. And in order to do that, we have to uh, move our vision into uh, that spectrum of moonlight. So here's a trick uh, that I figured out that made this initial breakthrough uh, amazing for me. Imagine a little moon while you're staring at your plant, a little moon right in the center of the plant so that it re-stimulates the notion of moonlight. And it's really that simple. So I'm looking at a plant. I'm holding my thoughts still and as silent as possible. Any thoughts that come about are relating to the plant, about the plant, from the plant's perspective. I see a moon. I see and I feel the feelings of moonlight. And all of a sudden, the room gets darker. The plant begins to glow. It gets brighter 
and there's almost like a pall that comes over the rest of the environment, everything else around what we've committed our observation to. And as we stick and stay deep in thought uh, or non-thought from the position or the perspective of the plant and feeling and exchanging love with this plant, because, you know, plants come out of the mineral realm, animals come out of the plant realm, people come out of the animal realm. We're all connected and we're built up of the lower levels below us. And so we have to have a love feeling for these other elements below us. And in the process of doing this, things start taking on changes that will blow your mind. Sometimes along the lines of psychedelics, sometimes along the lines of just pure magic. And what a person will begin to see, and this is a, an illusion, but you would never know it once you get in, once you hit the stage. And this can happen within just a, a couple minutes of this exercise. The plant will appear to grow and float up and down in front of you. And you will not be able to tell that it is not physically moving because the spiritual body, which you've tuned into of the plant, is all you see. The physical realm has passed away, and the spiritual plant and its activity act differently. It's alive. Even things that seem still and dead in this dimension are actually alive when we still our minds. Again, another thing we were talking about a few weeks ago, the analogy of the, the pond in our mind with the ripples. We stop the thoughts, we still the pond, and then we can see the reflection of the sun. Then the world starts to move when we stop moving. And then after this, as we stay focused even deeper, the light gets so bright, as bright as the sun coming off of these petals, that it's glowing, we'll actually get sucked in or move right into the soul spirit of the plant. And we'll be confronted by a nature spirit. According to Steiner, this is the offspring of the third higher hierarchy, uh, the nature spirits. So we have different uh, spiritual beings at different levels of the hierarchy. We have uh, archangels and, uh, you know, seraphim and cherubim, and we have uh, different levels of ungaloi. And these beings, each of these are responsible for time, they're responsible for form, they're responsible for space. And all these spirits are all pervading, and they're all, all around us, and they make up our reality as it is. So when we're in this spiritual state, we've actually moved over, and I'll just relay my personal experience, my first experience with this. Having popped over, in an, I was uh, doing the meditation on an orchid, and then I was confronted by a being standing in front of a giant source of light, smiling serene, serenely blessed and in a heavenly spiritual state within this being with two arms, two legs, and a head that went up and sloped down, which is its main distinguishing feature, and a body in one suit of pink and white, which were the colors of the flower petals. This is the plant spirit that was lording over that plant, the species plant spirit. And he smiled... And he just stood there in bliss. And I couldn't believe all the bliss I was feeling in this dimension. All this light and love that was radiating. And I began to laugh because of the astonishment and the awesomeness of it. More real than this reality. More high definition than this reality than you'll see in this world. And then I started to pull back out. Because now I was having thoughts about non-plant things. Now I was having personal thoughts and reflecting on myself and that created the separation between me and this other dimensional being. This is an experience that has been uh, loosely written about uh, or uh, cryptically written about by other authors, not so plainly stated uh, because of certain esoteric reasons. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like it's really important that we all don't get out of this life without knowing that there are bridges to these other dimensions that anybody with a little bit of time and patience and dedication to learning and the heart of devotion towards God and nature can experience. And something like that 
changes your life uh, dramatically. As a result of that experience, uh, sitting on my bed, uh, having come out of that most blessed experience, I realized what the state of meditation is. I was able to replicate the form of my inner thought life in those moments and go right into that state. And as a result, uh, in the dark, I did another meditation on a plant, which caused me to see a purple cloud hovering over that plant. And months later, I would read Steiner discuss who this nature being was that I saw in this plant, who this and what this purple cloud was hanging over this other plant. And I learned that these are in fact over and behind all plant life. So in for me, that was a really good thing to see it kind of affirmed in that way, not having been informed prior about it, so that I could not have been influenced to have originated that kind of thought. Uh, now I've sowed the seed in your head, so, you know, you, you might be hallucinating it if you, you're not sure, because you'll be sure when you've done this uh, correctly. So after I saw this purple cloud hovering over this uh, other plant in the darkness of my room, as I entered into that state, that meditative state, I decided, because it was, it was sparkling, like glitter was in it, it was something flipping in it, it was alive. And according to Steiner later, it's actually pulling the plant up. The plant isn't pushing up, it's being pulled up by the spiritual uh, being that hovers over it. I decided to look in that state of mind into the darkness of my hallway to see what else I might see in the spectrum of light, the spectrum of moonlight. And all of a sudden, I began seeing spirits, beings, uh, individual entities, some humanoid shape, some wafting uh, legless spirits, and others like uh, marsupial beings, like creatures, uh, all over the floor and around in these neon colors. Then, that's the moment that changed my life, because now I can enter that state at any time. And... Uh, that's really what I was searching for months before I came into uh, this. I was praying, meditating, and visualizing, walking down the street and looking off to the side and seeing spirit and continuing my walk and stopping and looking off to the side and seeing spirit. as a way to kind of law of attract or visualize what I was looking for, which was a spiritual experience in my everyday material world. And that brought me through this, to this information and to this experience. And it's duplicatable for anybody. So there is a few things I would advise, though. If you're not a, a, someone who's dedicated, has a sense of devotion to the truth, yeah, you can open yourself up to demonic forces because you will be exposed to all kinds of forces, including forces that don't mean well. So you've really got to be dedicated to, to truth in order to uh, so you're still learning during the day behind the scenes to prepare you for some of the things you'll experience and be able to handle them because it can be uh, frightening if you don't know what you're looking at but once you get a grip on the relationship of your thoughts uh, to these other entities and how they respond to you based on your thoughts you'll realize there's nothing to fear you just need to maintain your center and maintain your peace and this is uh, the development of uh, elementary clairvoyance. That's what that is called. And it's one of the preceding steps uh, toward preparing oneself uh, for initiation. Uh, a lot of, uh, most of us have heard of this term of initiation. Freemasons uh, get people initiated. The Rosicrucians initiate people. All the mystical secret societies they go through practices and procedures in order to initiate people into the highest spiritual realities. So this is just beginning to get you acquainted with what is uh, to come in certain ways. Uh, like I said, that plant being I saw was at the lowest rung of heaven. So that major breakthrough I had, I had already entered heaven, uh, the, the lowest part of heaven where the spirit forms live, and it was blissful. Now, I've had other experiences uh, 
in heavenly dimensions, and we'll talk about those at other times, but those were not brought about through meditation or uh, sp you know, efforts on my behalf, but the experiences are worth sharing. So maybe another week I'll, I'll share something on that. For the law of attraction, we were talking, I had mentioned that earlier, law of attraction for conservative Christians. You know, this subject really goes um, deep for me because I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible. And I also believe that the Spirit of God and knowledge and wisdom uh, has been being communicated to mankind, uh, mankind since the beginning of time. And so I also believe in studying all the religions and getting an understanding of all the philosophies and putting it together to have a really comprehensive understanding instead of a dogmatic, uh, one way, my way, or the highway view of spirituality. Because as we start to learn more and more about how life has unfolded and wisdom has been given to the people, that makes zero sense. But when we hear about the law of attraction, most of us are turned off as Christians because we think uh, this is New Age, uh, paganism, New Age, uh, you know, occultism, or whatever. And we turned an eye from something like Solomon said, uh, he who answers a matter before he's heard it, to him it is a folly. And it is a folly for the Christians and the Christian churches to turn away from uh, specific themes. Uh, you know, we talk, talk about karma. They don't want to hear, but even the Bible says that whatsoever a man soweth, that too shall he reap. But let no man be deceived. Uh, you know, whatever he sows uh, is is going to be uh, repaid. God, God is not mocked. So when we think of the Bible, we remember things like ask, be, uh, believing that you receive and you will. The so-called law of attraction is really just a, a three-part instruction on how to pray. Ask, believe, and receive. Uh, with little notes on each one of those. What is it to ask? And what are the forms that takes? What is it to believe or wait patiently? And what is it to receive is there anything to do in that step the bible says according to your faith so be it unto you so yeah what you expect to come into being it does come about into your life uh, the good things the big hopes and dreams you have for yourself and the fears and so there's a lot to say for managing and being careful for the nature of all your thinking and if any of you last lack knowledge, let him ask of God who gives all liberally and without reproach. You can summon knowledge and wisdom. You can attract it, or if you want to use that word, or summon it simply by asking. And that goes for anything that you might want or need. The question comes uh, for a lot of people uh, with the law of attraction as to whether or not it's moral or ethical to ask God for things, as opposed to asking God for spiritual assistance, for patience, for virtues, and things like that. Is there any place for the re asking God for things in a believer's life? Uh, I find that uh, from time to time, I need things in my life. And if our provider who says we can ask and we will receive uh, is ready, willing, and listening and responding to these requests, um, then we have a answer to that right there. God is answering prayers. He is bringing people what they want. But a question is, what do they ask? It says, you ask, but you ask amiss that you might spend it upon the lusts of your flesh. So if you're sitting here wondering, well, if that's true, then why isn't God sending me the money I've been asking for? Or why isn't God giving me this or that? Well, in our heart of hearts, we know that as soon as we have it, we're going to be free to sin. We're free to, uh, you know, be a little Christian with that, be a little generous with that, but we're going to give ourselves a little something, something out of it too. And that becomes the priority, and that becomes the thing that really blocks it from happening. If we ask uh, not needing, ask for something, we let it go, we say God's will, not my will, and we let it go and move on, that is a faith-filled request that trusts God to either give it or not, but you're not going to sit wondering and waiting and watching the clock. That isn't faith. That is a, a fear-based action. And that's how a lot of us uh, approach our prayer life, as we ask and then, then we keep watching and waiting and seeing evidence of things not happening. And then we go on to attract and, and, and get those results. You know, our fear manifests 
uh, in the form of unanswered prayers. Without a vision, the people perish. You know, this idea of vision boards, uh, a lot of uh, Christians feel like there's no place for vision boards. This is a form of witchcraft or something like that. Well, the Bible says without a vision, the people perish. If you work at a company or you've worked with any sort of group, you have a board and people you know, put down the objectives, the mission statements. They put down the, uh, the end goals that they expect to accomplish in the flow charts or the end object, you know, the picture of what the final product is to look like. And so uh, this sort of uh, knowledge shouldn't belong just to a, a new age self-help guru. Uh, who's teaching it that nobody wants to listen to because they're not Christian. It shouldn't belong to business practices. It should belong to all of us in our daily life. Whatever you need, try a vision board. I've had, m all my vision boards have uh, been successful, manifested some of the craziest things. Uh, I had a vision board on there. I had uh, Welcome to Kenya. There was a uh, Four Seasons jet flying there was a woman walking hand in hand with a gorilla. There was uh, somebody shark cage diving on this, uh, things like this. And within a few weeks, uh, through circumstances outside of myself, uh, everything had occurred to make a, a trip to Africa happen, where I stayed at the Four Seasons and flew above it. So that Four Seasons jet manifested as flying over the four seasons. I made hand-to-hand -hand contact with one silverback gorilla and, and two uh, baboons, just like the picture. I was in uh, South Africa, shark cage diving, just like the picture on the vision board. Went to Kenya. Everything on the board had manifested, and that's how uh, all the boards have happened uh, for me. They find interesting ways to show their face in the material realm. If you put up something, you're consistent about what you're looking at, you're not wavering in the details of how it looks, uh, then that consistency will expedite its manifestation in your life. Um, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Uh, I think this does relate mostly to you know, the, the search for, uh, for Christ, for the Christ in our life for the manifestation of the Spirit in our life, and the Spirit making His presence known in our day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, comes about through what some might call a, a dark night of the soul. It could come about through a deep introspection and prayer, uh, and something will change uh, for a person. I can relay a story that uh, some may not have ever heard or experienced, uh, but it is not uh, unlike the experience uh, or the story that we've heard from uh, Socrates and his Damien. This spirit that stays within the skin that he consults and asks yes or no questions to, and depending on its reaction, he knew whether a thing was right or wrong. Well, I was in a night of prayer uh, one night praying very deeply and all of a sudden I had this feeling on my leg that something was touching it. Now I was real deep. I was sorrowful. I was weeping. I really felt like I was, you know, doomed and destined for hell. And so I was contrite and, and broken in spirit. And all of a sudden in the midst of, of all that sadness that I, and sorrow I was feeling, something started to happen to my flesh on my body. A feeling, a sensation. And I opened up my eyes to see what was touching me and there was nothing. And then I changed my thought about what I was thinking about this predestination for hell based on just all the flaws in me. And all of a sudden the sensation moved over to the other leg. And then I, thought, I changed my thinking back again and I noticed how the feelings that I'm experiencing on the surface of my skin were related directly to my thinking and that there was an intelligence that was communicating by way of this sensation. Now, this might seem far out for a lot of people, but at the same time, we've got people saying they're waiting for the comforter. They're waiting for the Spirit of God to come and commune with them, to assist them, a still small voice to tell them this way or that to go. 
we don't really know what that looks like. I think a lot of times we simply imagine that uh, our, we'll have an intuitive nudge, and that's the spirit instead of a constant communication with what seems to be a sixth sense. And uh, that might be far out for a lot of people. Just go ahead and ignore it if it doesn't mean anything to you. But if you have experienced anything like that, if you feel, and, and this manifests for everybody, that's the thing, in the form of an itch, in the form of a discomfort, a sharp pain, if we become conscious of our thoughts and feelings at every given moment, we will correlate the arising of these sensations with our thoughts and we'll realize that the sensations are not coincidence, that they are tied directly to our thoughts, that it is uh, not unlike uh, what uh, was it uh, Isaiah said, I believe it was, uh, he said, woe is me for I am undone, for I dwelt amongst the people of unclean lips. And then an angel took a hot coal off the altar and placed it on his lips, and it purged out his sin. I'm going to convey, since I'm getting ready to probably share some of this uh, books from this, uh, words from this book called Conversations with Angels by Emanuel Swedenborg, I'm going to tell you a little story. One day I was sitting on a, in a chair by myself in uh, my apartment, and I was in this sort of meditative state of mind, not intentionally. I was more or less exhausted from my day at work. and But I was still in this meditative state of mind, and my head went down and looked to the right, and I saw inside of myself. And there was an altar with what seemed to be my body standing there, naked, like a living voodoo doll, just standing there. And I didn't get the this kind of voodoo doll notion until I, f I saw an angel touch my arm in that vision and I felt the burn I felt the pain on my exterior arm and I realized that uh, I'm being communicated to possibly by angels and then when I read that verse that makes a lot more sense that these things that are occurring that even the things that come from without if you bump your own elbow there's a law of attraction aspect to that this is a result of you know like for instance, if it's your right elbow, the right and the left sides of your brain, the kinds of thinking, logic, or imaginative, well, the body's broken up that way too. And when the sensations happen on e either side, you can find pretty quickly what it's correlating to. So if my right hand gets a pain or it gets a feeling or sensation, then I know the nature of my thoughts that are dealing with imaginative works is being uh, addressed Maybe it's being rebuked. Maybe the spirit saying, don't do that. If I bump my elbow on something, it could be that, uh, again, my imaginative work, and we're looking up the arm, so this is less about what we're touching. It's a, it's a, a deeper level that precedes touch and thought. I know it's, it's a bit abstract, but this correlating aspects of the body with aspects of the thought, it is a very abstract subject. And hits like that, things that seem like coincidences are actually the body and the world working together to self-rebuke the aberration that's in you. You are bringing about the good and the bad that comes to you, whether in the long term, karmically, or whether in the short term, in the moment. So thinking in terms of how our inner thought life is manifesting outside of us, for many years I correlated when the sensations would happen, what kind of thought, what was my nature of thinking, I became more and more and more conscious of my thoughts and my feelings at any given moment so that I could be prepared to instantly compare it to the sensations that I was feeling and where I was feeling it in order to correlate this language of the body. What was happening, where in my body, and where that correlated uh, to my psychology. Then all of a sudden I had this... Uh, language of communication between my thought life and a spiritual intelligence who was trying to edify and correct my behavior. And so I was able in an instant to know that this thought of uh, doing this action or this thought of thinking this thought or having these feelings towards who or what 
what's the problem. And it, sometimes it just needs to be pulled back, modified. Sometimes you need to U-turn. But if you don't listen to the spirit when it's talking to you, when it's touching you, then bad things I found would happen. And so the reason I brought up uh, Socrates is because I went years having nothing to correlate this to, this seemingly unique spiritual phenomena that was occurring to me until while I was working at the Church of Scientology, studying one of L. Ron Hubbard's lectures. He talked about uh, uh, Socrates and his Damien, and he described it, and I perked way up because here is my first clue as somebody else who's having something comparable. And he described it as making a feeling when a thought was wrong and being completely still when the thought was correct. And that was the relationship that I was in. I knew the thoughts were correct, my logic was correct, and rationale was correct when my body was completely still. And if I felt any kind of sensation, that meant there was some sort of aberration in my thinking. This is what gave him the confidence to drink, drink the hemlock, which is the poison that he was uh, condemned to drink. He consulted the spirit, and the spirit, completely still, gave him the confidence to drink that poison, knowing that it was his spiritual destiny, that that was the path he was supposed to go. Obviously, that's not a great example uh, for people that are only thinking in terms of staying, staying alive, but uh, Socrates helped the people around him by asking this Damien, which is where we get the word uh, uh, genius, uh, genie, spirit, uh, or even demon from. But this is not a, a demon in that sense. This is more of a guiding spiritual force, not a negative force. This being so wise and holy never errs and, uh, and is of the utmost holiness. So, you know, don't let the word derivations pull you away from uh, what is part of uh, your spiritual uh, inheritance. And so, anyway, uh, as a result of hearing how he worked with his, I was able to get some identity on what was happening to me and the spiritual being about me. And yeah, I'm kind of at a loss for words. It's very hard for me to articulate because, like I said, I only have that one description to go by, my personal experience, and a lot of people haven't, haven't had such a sensation. But I also beg to differ with that statement because I believe we're all being spoken to by the Spirit every day. Every day I see somebody touch their eye after having a thought or, or grab their ear and itch their ear. I can read into their thoughts. I know what kind of thoughts they were thinking because I know what kind of thoughts cause the itching of an ear, cause the itching of right under the right eye, right above the left eye, or wherever, even though we write all of that off to coincidence, some sort of biological condition, atmospheric conditions, all of these materialistic interpretations of our uh, living that we try to write off the spiritual's presence, the spirit's presence by. So... Finally, I'm going to point out on the LOA topic, even though I had just digressed. Um, give, and it is given. Press down, shaken, and running over will be poured into your cup. But you give people in terms of love, forgiveness, having faith in them, putting them above you. Um, I, that comes back to you. So it's not just the physical things you give, which is really important. And I was going to save a little bit of this for... Uh, you know, next week, but, you know, think about the homeless people. You're driving down the road, and uh, you're turning your eyes away from homeless people as though you yourself won't be in need one day. And if you pay attention to the way that you treat people who need your assistance and the way that you treat them, you'll see a correlation with how people treat you, especially in your times of need. And in those moments, if you can receive what's happening to you, you'll realize that the law of attraction or reaping and sowing is working everywhere. And God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. So I'll talk more about homeless people later because I got a lot to say about that. Um, we've talked about uh, driving a bit and uh, how a, a selfless heart will have the road open up for them. Being compassionate to other people will... will uh, afford you compassion 
from other drivers when you're not in your A game. Talked about my interdimensional experiences and how somebody who is striving toward elementary clairvoyance, part of their spiritual path, they could research into How to Know Higher Worlds by Rudolf Steiner, and other esoteric occult teachings that deal with Christian esotericism or just spirituality in general, uh, will bring you in touch with these other dimensions. So if you're tired of intellectualizing about spirituality and are tired of waiting for the kingdom of heaven and you know that it's around you and in you, like Jesus said, uh, and it's not in a far off place, you're not waiting for it to arrive, but it's around you and outside of you. Um, that might be a path to help you uh, get more hands-on with your spirituality. The law of attraction, uh, like we're talking about, it applies to everybody, no matter what you call it, no matter what the tradition calls it, whether you call it karma, whether you call it sowing and reaping, uh, or whether you call it law of attraction or any other name. We are responsible for the things that come into our lives. Uh, I think one of the hard points to swallow for people, though, is the idea of diseases, of bad things happening to good people, children being born into disabilities or sickness. Um, these sorts of things are hard for people to process. And I think especially uh, Christians and people who haven't adapted uh the teaching of reincarnation into their spiritual life. The concept of reincarnation, like we were talking about a couple weeks ago, goes way back to the ancient Christian forefathers before the t time of Jesus, during the time of Jesus, and it wasn't until uh, Constantine and Rome started to uh, adapt Christianity as the religion and blending it with paganism and extracting certain teachings and the 95 thesis happened that we came out of this having lost core beliefs like that. Beliefs that were there have now been lost through a couple of those processes in uh, Earth's history. But without the, that knowledge, you can't answer why a person is born into a certain condition, why a bad thing uh, or seemingly bad thing is happening to a seemingly good person. Steiner talks about the uh, uh, emergence or the presence of disease in a life being uh, a byproduct of a, an, a, an addictive quality or action in a prior life. If we remember that in prior lives, whenever we do something, if we can't experience the karma in that life, you know, again, God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, you will reap. So you're not going to get out of it just because you've, you've died. Your, your conscience, in order to purify itself, will require uh, that it makes things right in life. And so these reincarnation cycles and ideas which uh, pervade most of the world's religions actually answer um, nearly all of the questions that, if I walk into a regular church nowadays, have to go unanswered because they've cut out a big piece of doctrine, a significant a meaningful piece of doctrine that relates to why we're here and where we're going. And it's become, in that way, it's become materialistic. It's become all about this life instead of about the bigger picture, our destiny, where we've come from in creation and, and where we're destined to go. So we're going to take a, we're going to take a quick break real quick. We'll come back and then uh, talk about next week's show. Just a moment. Final thing, I said by one final thing, I mean about five final things, real quick before we go here in a couple minutes, is if you're interested in having a more hands-on experience with spirituality as a tangible uh, 
thing instead of a so so called state of peace that doesn't really change much it lowers your heart rate okay if that's why you meditate to lower your heart rate or something what i'm about to say maybe isn't for you if you're trying to access spiritual realities uh here's some other tools aside of those effective spiritual meditations you might look into uh if you've never heard of graphology or handwriting analysis you might look into that handwriting uh wizard.com handwriting university.com uh those are good sites for uh, learning about that art and what it is is your cursive writing we can tell about your personality based on how you put your letters together so your personality is coming through in the shape of your a and the shape of your t where you put that t bar how tall is that t these little details um in your writing you can change and that's called graphotherapy and it will change your personality so if you're looking for something new to try out today go look that up also a chinese face reading if you haven't heard of that, have, there's a documentary on, I think it's Netflix right now, about Chinese face reading. Uh, and we were talking about it a couple weeks ago also. You know, the position of your eyebrows, if they're high, they show a discerning person. If, you, if your forehead's big, you're a big picture person. If you have high cheekbones, you're adventurous. Or big lips, you're uh, a generous person. Uh, long chin, you're tenacious. If it's wide, you're confrontational. So get to know yourself using these external forms of knowledge about yourself. Numerology, Hans Dekaz. Go to dekaz.com, D-O-D-E-C-O-Z.com, and get a free numerology report. Uh, these things know you better than you know yourself. It, it comes out of uh, ancient Judaism. Uh, it uses your birth date, your name, as it was assigned to you at your birth, and uh, runs uh, various mathematical formulas, gives you numbers and interpretations, and produces a 100-plus page report about you. And uh, you can get that free getting uh, Dekaz's um, older uh, software that's available on his website. And um, astrology. Uh, a lot of uh, people nowadays who are into this astrotheology, you know, are pointing out that Daniel was an astrologer, that the three wise men found Jesus by way of astrology, there is a spiritual use for spiritual technologies that when used inappropriately towards selfish gain, make them black magic. What would otherwise be tools for a believer trying to attain the kingdom of heaven and, and everlasting life. And if you want to take an ag uh, aggressive growth, um, you might get some of these things that make it very clear and help you make changes quick. Phrenology, eh. I don't know, a lot of, that's one of these, with the rest of these, a lot of people think these are pseudosciences. The bumps on the head. You see characteristics of the internal personality in your writing, in your physical body, in your name, in, in, the, in the charts of the moment you were born, and yeah, in the bumps in your head. I think uh, also a uh, neat thing to note is something called um, uh, referring to a, a one's physiognomy. Um, I think this is kind of overlooked a lot because we don't put a lot of stock in what we see in uh, another person's uh, face or appearance. But things come through in a physiognomy. We see somebody has a sinister look. They have those slit eyes and they're downturned. And this isn't about judging people by the way they look, but it's about recognizing that the soul is manifesting itself in the physical body. So in the future, according to Steiner, in about a thousand plus years, we will be incarnated into bodies which very directly reflect, our, uh, our physiognomy will reflect our spiritual state. So people of a loving spiritual disposition will have naturally loving spiritual uh, appearance about them and others who are uh, evil and malicious in their intention, they're gonna have a very obvious sinister sort of exterior. So right now there's a mix of genetics and other conditions uh, that blend that our physiognomy blends into but uh that's an interesting thing to look into if if you're into the spiritual uh side of the physical world so uh next week uh we'll talk about maybe homelessness we'll talk about spiritual scientific approaches that means these uh religions these different secret societies and things like that and what they're teaching 
Uh, like and follow us on Facebook uh, at Spiritual Realities, so facebook.com slash spiritual realities. We're on newprecept.com. That's uh, our site, so it's N-E-W-P-R-E-C-E-P-T. Uh, and sign up for the mailing list. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, any rage at my heretical uh, blasphemies or anything you think I've said today, uh, I want to hear about them. I want to talk about them and make sure I'm making myself clear where I can. So just email me, robber at newprecept.com. The show's on Spotify, iTunes, Facebook Live. So uh, the podcast form of this, if you uh, are not listening live, that can be had there, or perhaps that's what you're listening to right now. Um, Adam is out today. He'll be he'll be back uh, next week, and uh, we're gonna have uh, some more uh, deep explorations of these interdimensional states of consciousness that I and our guests have happen, uh, had happen, and we want to focus on how you too can have those experiences. So more than just relating things that have happened to people, boring. Uh, we want to talk about how you yourself can get into that position. So we need to reverse engineer these experiences so you can move forward and deeper in your walk. Next week, we'll also uh, touch more on Emanuel Swedenborg, which I didn't really get to talk about this week, and his experiences in heaven and hell, uh, talking with angels, talking with newly deceased peoples that have crossed over. Steiner has a lot of accounts like that. And people's misconceptions about what heaven was to be like and the way the angels approach them and, and kind of laugh off their misconceptions and teach them what it really is um, because we are still in this day and age of living under a lot of illusions. So I guess that's it. We'll talk to you next week. This love, this love.